All right. Well, good evening. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight to our event, which is called Building a Quantum Secure Future in Chicago. Uh, it's part of the fifth annual Chicago Quantum Summit, hosted by the Chicago Quantum Exchange. My name is Jean Whalen. I'm a reporter at the Washington Post, writing about business and technology, uh, including over the last few years on occasion uh, about quantum technology. I've had the, the good luck to be able to write about quantum every now and then, including some of the great work happening right here in the Chicago area at University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab in the western suburbs. Um, quantum technology, as some of you may know and some of you may, may be new to the topic, has the potential to transform many things. It could someday, although it's at an early stage now, it could, it could someday create very powerful new computers that will be capable of carrying out calculations far beyond what existing computers can do. It may also create very powerful new sensors that can possibly predict better when an earthquake is coming or can better uh, carry out medical imaging that will help diagnose disease better. And it can also possibly someday create a stronger internet that will be much harder to hack. So this evening, with the help of some quantum researchers and entrepreneurs, we're going to dive into what quantum technology is how it works, and how it could transform industries from banking to healthcare, uh, right here in Chicago and across the globe. We're going to begin with a short keynote talk from Marco Pistoia, who is the head of Global Technology Applied Research at J.P. Morgan Chase, the bank, uh, where he leads a team of quantum experts. Marco joined the bank in 2020 after serving as a senior researcher at IBM where he led an international team of researchers responsible for quantum computing algorithms and applications. Marco is the inventor of over 250 patents granted by the US Patent and Trademark Office uh, and over 300 patent pending applications. He's also the author of over 400 scholarly papers published in various journals. Please join me in welcoming Marco Pistoia. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. I want to thank Professor uh, David Ashwalom and the Chicago Quantum Exchange for inviting me here today. It's, it's a big honor to present uh, the work that we're doing at JP Morgan Chase um, in the area of quantum technology. So I just wanted to start by um, giving a quick overview of uh, the work that we're doing, not just in quantum. So very briefly, um, it can be a surprise to see that a bank is actually working on front, like a frontier three technology, you know, like a horizon three technology, quantum computing, quantum communication, but also um, augmented and virtual reality and internet of things, cloud security. Uh, we're doing research in all these areas because in reality, JP Morgan Chase is not just a bank, it's a technology company. We have almost 60,000 technologists and uh, we have a budget of like billions of dollars that we spend every year in technology. So it just makes sense for us to work on uh, um, things that um, are more in the future so that when uh, these uh, technologies become real, we are not caught, caught off guard. You know, we have already um, built an infrastructure inside the company. And that's exactly what we're doing in the area of, uh, uh, of quantum. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we are uh, performing research, so it's a, it's a fully-fledged research organization. In fact, we publish our work. Uh, we have already, since the beginning of 2020, when I joined the JP Morgan Chase, uh, over 40 scholarly publications that have appeared in journals and conferences. Uh, the scientific community has recognized our work. We have over 1,000 citations for the work of the last uh, almost three years and uh, uh, over 30 patents. Um, so uh, let me tell you why um, we think quantum is important for finance. In fact, uh, there is an article that appeared in um, um, a report like, uh, by McKinsey and Company that says that uh, the first industry sector to benefit from quantum computing is going to be finance. 
which is really surprising. You know, quantum was definitely not introduced for finance. It was introduced for physics and chemistry. But in reality, the reason why this is happening is that uh, uh, quantum uh, will accelerate a lot of um, uh, applications, and uh, especially those that have a very high complexity. And the financial industry is full of such applications. We have a lot of use cases with uh, exponential complexity, meaning very high complexity applications that we are already executing right now, of course. It's not that we're not solving these problems, but we're solving them through approximations. So we want to eventually come to the point in which we will not approximate things anymore, and we will solve them accurately. And also finance has another requirement. Uh, time is of the essence. Uh, if we were a pharmaceutical company, maybe we could afford the running a computation for three days to compute, for example, the perfect molecule for a vaccine or something like that. But uh, in finance, uh, three days is too much. We need answers right away because the market changes all the time, so every second. So we need um, real-time answers, and that's why finance lends itself to quantum computing so well. So we saw that the classical computing uh, became more and more powerful every year, almost like a linear growth. But as you see, there will be a point that's called the quantum advantage. Um, at that point, uh, quantum computers will uh, surpass um, classical computers. So what we do today with uh, classical computers will still be doable with classical computers, but quantum computers will be more powerful, faster, more accurate. Then there will be another um, milestone called quantum supremacy, which we expect to come later, but uh, quantum supremacy will identify the point in which quantum computers will be able to do things that a classical computer cannot do in any reasonable amount of time. So when quantum advantage becomes a reality, we will see that uh, uh, rapid growth of um, um, computational power. And the reason why this happens is due to um, two properties that uh, quantum computing borrows from uh, uh, quantum mechanics. So um, one is called the superposition. So you know that uh, in everyday computation, like everything that we do with a classical computer, uh, the fundamental unit of information is a bit which can be either zero or one. In quantum computing, um, we, don't, we don't have a bit, we have a quantum bit, also known as a qubit. And a qubit can be in superposition of zero and one at the same time. So this allows for multiple uh, inputs to be um, given to a program at the same time. So for example, imagine if you have a program that uh, takes uh, a value that can be either zero or false, and you want to execute it one time with zero, one time with false, just to see what happens in both cases. Uh, well, in classical computing, you have to execute it twice, one time with uh, false, one time with true. In quantum computing, you can execute it just once with uh, false and true in superposition. Of course, it sounds like, okay, we saved the one execution, but imagine when you have uh, many inputs, not just two, and you want to combine them together and execute a program with all these inputs together. So with many qubits, you have uh, an exponential uh, advantage. And the exponential advantage actually comes also for the property of entanglement, which allows two particles, so in, um, in quantum mechanics, two particles are entangled when the state of one particle is linked to the state of another particle, of the other particle. So changing the state of one of these particles immediately changes the state of um, any other particle that is entangled to the first one. Um, it, no matter how distant these two particles are from each other. So um, by putting this property inside a computer, making uh, qubits, giving qubits the ability to be entangled with each other, we now have this uh, a very interesting result. That every time you add a qubit to a quantum computer, its computational power doubles, it gets multiplied by two. Now, if you take your calculator and you do like two times two times two times two times two, and you keep doing that, in a very short amount of time, your calculator will go out of uh, uh, capability. You will not be able to complete the computation. You will get an error because it sounds like um, a, small, a small growth, but in reality, it's huge. Doubling and doubling and doubling in a short amount of time gets out of hand. And so a quantum computer will be able to manage these applications that have this type of complexity. 
Um, so I just wanted to give you an example that um, is not so much related to finance, but in reality, it is related. Let me explain why. Because um, chemistry and finance are two different industry domains, but uh, uh, many algorithms that are used for finance are the same that you would use for chemistry, because a lot of algorithms boil down to optimization algorithms. So imagine if we wanted to use a classical computer to um, compute the energy, uh, the ground state energy of a molecule, for example, water, um, the first uh, row in this table, you would need uh, uh, 10,000 uh, classical bits. So uh, basically uh, 10 to the power of four or 10,000. However, a quantum computer does the same job with only 14 qubits. This is not a big deal because a classical computer can easily manage 10,000 bits. Uh, but if you go down in the table, you reach uh, caffeine, you will see that uh, you need uh, 10 to the power of 48 classical bits to simulate on a computer the molecule of caffeine. Um, and just to give an idea how big this number is, the number of atoms uh, on the Earth is 10 to the power of 49. So it's, um, we're saying here that you would need a computer whose number of bits is one-tenth of the number of atoms of our planet. So we would never have such a classical computer. Um, on the other hand, uh, a quantum computer will be able to do this with only 160 uh, like perfect qubits. Um, and that's the challenge. Now our qubits are not perfect. We might have some computers with uh, 160, even more qubits, but we need that type of quality as well. But still, you know, we're getting there. And um, the reason why I wanted to emphasize why uh, 160 is rated to 10 to the power of 48 is that if you take a calculator, you do 2 to the power of 160, it's approximately the same as 10 to the power of 48. Again, because the quantum computer uh, takes the number of qubits and th that becomes the exponent of a power. And that uh, power is the uh, computational power of uh, the quantum computer. But so besides the arithmetic behind all of this, I just wanted to show you like the gigantic difference that there is between the classical bits column and the um, qubits column here. You see that, you know, then like uh, not uh, comparable almost to each other because as I said before, like we go from a number that represents almost the number of atoms of the earth versus 160. So let's go to an example that is more related to finance, which is like um, the one that you see at the bottom left corner of the slide. Um, Thanksgiving is uh, behind, uh, you know, it's coming. So you probably will have people for dinner. You, if you are thinking about how you can sit 10 people around the table, uh, maybe many of you didn't think about it, but um, you have uh, 3,628,800 uh, uh, possible ways to sit 10 people around the table. So if you, are, if you want to optimize um, the dinner table, so maxim, like uh, maximizing the chances of people who like each other to sit next to each other, minimizing the chances of people who don't like each other that are sitting next to each other. So you have to take all these combinations and then find out which, what, which one is the best. So a classical computer will have no problem with this number, 3,600,000, it's not too big, but uh, if you think it's only coming from 10 people, what if we had uh, 100 people? What if we were optimizing the routes of uh, a UPS truck? Usually they make 120 stops every day, I heard. So what if we wanted to optimize a portfolio of assets in a bank? which uh, sometimes we optimize portfolios with thousands of assets. The number would be so big that these uh, computations cannot be done uh, precisely in any reasonable amount of time. And that's where we need the power of quantum computing. And the, these use cases that you see here, like uh, portfolio optimization, risk analysis, and uh, um, uh, derivative pricing and machine learning are super important for, for banks, for JP Morgan Chase in particular, and these are applications that have this type of exponential complexity for which we want to use uh, quantum computing. Um, so uh, in JP Morgan Chase, we have already written several algorithms 
in this space, for example, in the, in the area of optimization, in the area of risk analysis, and also in the area of machine learning. We recently published an article describing how to do extractive text summarization. In other words, you get uh, a document that can be pages and pages of document. We can actually extract a summary of this document automatically using a quantum computer and uh, reduce the length of what a person has to read without losing the uh, fundamental concepts of this document. So maximizing the centrality of the sentences that we give to the user and minimizing the redundancy. So if there are two sentences that are similar to each other, there is no reason to give the user both sentences. So this is very important in, in finance as well, because imagine how many documents um, traders have to, to read every day to better understand what is a good investment. Or imagine the legal department of a bank, how many pages and pages they have to read quickly before um, like completing a very important transaction, uh, uh, like for example, um, an acquisition and so on. Of course, everything has to be read eventually, but it's good to have a tool that pinpoints the critical sections. So uh, having said how good quantum computing um, is, I just wanted to say that uh, sometimes it can be said that it is too good. Like, uh, um, it, it solves all these problems, but it also solves problems that we didn't want it to solve. For example, breaking cryptography. Um, this is a, uh, cryptography is based on very complicated um, problems that uh, so far nobody has been able to break cryptography because nobody has been able to solve the problems behind the cryptographic algorithms. With quantum computing, um, attackers will be able to break uh, cryptography. And uh, how many, how big does a quantum computer have to be in order to break cryptography? At the beginning of, um, so there is an algorithm called the Shor's algorithm. At the beginning it was estimated that it would take a billion qubits um, to break uh, cryptography in one day. Uh, so people would say, well, you know, we have a long way to go before getting to a, a billion qubits. So then new research was performed and we came down to 20 million qubits. Uh, to break cryptography in eight hours. And just uh, uh, last year, uh, researchers proved that um, with only 13,436 qubits, uh, we can break cryptography in uh, 177 days, which is less than six months. And the, um, the age of our, so the lifespan of our cryptographic keys is definitely longer than six months. So this is a serious problem. What can somebody do with uh, the power of a quantum computer then? they can take somebody's public key, each one of us has a public and a private key, so the public key is known to everyone. Uh, you can take somebody's public key and compute the corresponding private key, which should be known only to you. So with the private key, an attacker can impersonate other individuals, can decrypt contents, can apply digital signatures on documents, so it's gonna be a, a, big, a big problem. So um, one solution to this problem is to use uh, post-quantum cryptography, um, you can see that uh, um, on the left. Post-quantum cryptography is a, um, like a, a technology, uh, so new cryptographic algorithms, but they're still classical algorithms. We're not talking about quantum algorithms. Classical algorithms running on classical computers, who, who these algorithms are supposed to be quantum resistant, but there is no proof. As a matter of fact, uh, the um, uh, the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, issued a call for post-quantum post cryptography algorithms in 2017. Uh, we got uh, actually 82, there is a, a, a typo here, um, not 84, but 82 uh, algorithms were submitted. Uh, after five years, we are down with only four, from 82 to four. We lost uh, 78 algorithms along the way because they were found to be vulnerable. And these were algorithms that have been around for a long time, studied and dissected by researchers worldwide. So the end, the end uh, conclusion here is that the post-quantum cryptography is great because it still allows people to use uh, public and private keys, but uh, it may not be enough. So we're working on uh, another technology that is called the quantum distribution, which is a part of another 
like a branch of quantum technology called the quantum communications. So with quantum key distribution, you can actually allow two parties to agree on the same cryptographic key without using any algorithm. It's just an exchange of quantum states, an exchange of qubits. Uh, this technology has been mathematically proven to be unbreakable. And uh, um, in February of this year, we published a result um, along with Toshiba and Siena, JP Morgan Chase proved that uh, uh, quantum key distribution is actually doable. We um, demonstrated it in, uh, in, in our uh, lab at uh, JP Morgan Chase in Columbus, Ohio. We were able to build a quantum key distribution network long, like that was 100 kilometers long, capable of uh, transmitting data in like industrial data rates, and we secured a blockchain application as well. So um, I just wanted to say um, that uh, the work that I just mentioned that was done by uh, J.P. Morgan Chase in collaboration with Toshiba and Siena has now got, went out of the lab, basically. So Professor Ashwalom and uh, uh, his team at the Chicago Quantum Exchange, they have actually um, demonstrated quantum key distribution also like a, in, uh, in the open, you know, it doesn't have to be in a lab. It works between, say, University of Chicago and Argonne National Lab. And uh, I think it was just uh, um, three weeks ago or so that uh, they demonstrated a voting application running on this uh, quantum key distribution network in the presence of President Obama, who uh, was there. And uh, um, of course, quantum key distribution is uh, already available in production, by the way. It's more mature than uh, quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing is not yet used in production because we still uh, lack the computers, the capability of uh, uh, like uh, uh, serving us in real time um, precisely. However, uh, quantum key distribution is not computing. It's another branch. It's not doing computations. It's just transmitting photons, um, and the technology is stable enough to be used in production. In fact. It's used in many countries like Singapore, um, South Korea, China, and the European Union, England, and Switzerland, and even India. I just found out that uh, there have been uh, deployments of QKD in India as well. So um, I think I want to conclude with this call to action. So um, even though when it comes to quantum computing and quantum communications, uh, the technology may not be so ready, um, I think we have to become ready, though. We have to start working towards building our infrastructure in our, in our companies, uh, universities, or national labs in order to, um, say, build a team, uh, build algorithms that uh, uh, will solve the applications in the future. Of course, some applications will lend themselves to quantum advantage before other applications. We call them the first wave applications. So we are already working towards identifying these applications. And it's also important to scale it. Like quantum computing is not like uh, moving a program from Windows to Unix or from Java to C++. Um, it's a completely different paradigm. So uh, it's important that this technology, even though it might start in a research group like it's happening in JP Morgan Chase, it also transitions outside of research and it becomes embraced by uh, the rest of the, of, of the company. So that's pretty much what I think every um, institution should do at this point. Thank you very much. There. Um, thank you very much, Marco. I think we're going to, if you want to have a seat there, and we'll bring the other speakers up. Um, uh, we're going to welcome two additional speakers now for a little discussion. We have Mirela Koleva, who is the CEO and co founder of Quant Opticon, a startup company developing software for use in quantum computing and communications. And we have David Aushalam, where's David? There he is, uh, a professor of molecular engineering at the University of Chicago, a senior scientist at Argonne National Lab, and the director of the Chicago Quantum Exchange, which is a hub where researchers from academia and industry discuss the future of quantum technology. So we're gonna have a discussion here. I guess we, we're all up on the stage, so yeah. Um, and at the end, we will have time for some questions from the audience. I don't know, David, if you're out there and can signal me when we're um, about 
when it's a good time to start with questions, that would be helpful. If not, I will, I will try to keep track of the time. Um, okay, I think it would help if we went over a few basics, just because, you know, to give, this is a tough topic. So, um, Mariela, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, quantum technology has grown out of the discoveries that scientists have made over the last 100 or so years in quantum physics, right? So what is quantum physics and how does it differ from classical physics that we all studied in high school? Sure, that's, that's a, it's a very interesting question. And um, Quantum technology, oh, sorry, quantum physics actually describes the, the way that matter behaves on the atomic scale. Uh, which is very, very different. The rules are very, very different uh, about how, how it actually, what, what it does on the nanoscale, on a, on a scale that is very, very small to be able to be seen with a human eye. Um, and uh, well, I think Marco already explained some of the weird ways that it, it behaves in terms of the qubits having, be, being in two different states at the same time and uh, being superimposed in a, uh, in a state of, Two different, two different states at the same time, so. Um. Gotcha, okay, and David, how would you describe the difference between classical physics and quantum physics? What, what is the difference? Weird. <laughs> um, I'd say the difference is, you know, classical physics is deterministic, that is, things are as they are, right? And in, in the quantum world, there's always uncertainty, a little bit like Marco was saying. Quantum bits are in infinite numbers of states, and you know they become an issue. They become something when you look at them. So we have to be comfortable with uncertainty and a different way of thinking about information. Okay. So the classical physics looks at objects in the large scale world, right? Quantum physics looks at these tiny particles in the quantum world, and they are atoms, electrons, photons. Those are, and they have these superpowers, these quantum particles, which Marco went over. Um, Maybe, David, I'm going to ask you to repeat what those are briefly, the, the kind of the two main superpowers that quantum uh, particles have and that make quantum technology potentially so powerful. Yeah, it's rare that a physicist can talk about superpowers. <laughs> so uh, I would say there are just two things that separate the quantum world from classical. One is what Marco talked about, which is called superposition. It just means a piece of information can be in an infinite number of states at the same time. So that's one thing. And the other, which is even harder, I think, for us to grasp is entanglement, which Marco also talked about. To put a piece of information into multiple bits, and then you separate them any distance, Earth to Moon, Earth to California, yeah. uh, and, the, yeah. and the act of looking at one changes the other, even though there's no physical connection. But that weird entanglement is what gives rise to these spectacular properties that Marco talked about. Gotcha, okay. So the, the heart of quantum technology is the quantum bit, as Marco um, described. It, it, can anyone tell me how, you, how do you make a quantum bit? How do you create a quantum bit and give it these superpowers that we're talking about? Yeah, so we, um, we're not really creating a quantum bit. We use, except for some technologies like superconducting circuits, but otherwise we use the uh, quantum particles that nature gave us. So, for example, some computers are based on um, uh, atoms, other computers are based on photons, others are based on ions, which are still atoms with some properties. So, um, given that these particles already have, uh, already have these properties that we're looking for, superposition and entanglements, they have been put at the core of these quantum computers. So, the challenge is, you know, we, are, we need to be able to manipulate these microscopic particles in a way that um, they can actually work in computations, and uh, these particles are also in these delicate states, you know, superposition and entanglement. So every single um, interference from the environment can um, ruin the state, damage the state uh, of, uh, of these particles. So the challenge right now that, has, that we're working on in the community, but it's actually making tremendous progress, is to uh, make these particles work exactly as we want them to work for computations. 
Gotcha. Okay, so, so we use actual quantum particles in some cases, atoms, yes. electrons, photons, photons, yes, photons exactly. which are tiny particles of light. Yeah, so we actually see uh, pros and cons in each technology. Of course, when it comes to quantum communication, quantum distributions, photons are the, uh, the ones that we need because they need to travel across the network, so they travel over fiber optic networks. Um, and so on. So, uh, depending on the use, the use that we want to make of these particles, um, some of them lend themselves better than other in different scenarios. Gotcha. Okay. And David, maybe you can talk a bit about the research that you're doing at University of Chicago into the quantum internet, which uses photons, tiny particles of light, to carry information. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it's, as Marco said, it's a real-world implementation of can you take these properties at the atomic scale to our scale to do something unique. And uh, what our students have done here in Chicago is to build a system where you can create these quantum states in one place, turn the information into light, and have that quantum state be transmitted through optical fibers, the same fibers we use today on the internet, uh, to a remote destination and literally entangle the objects over maybe 30 or 40 miles. <clears throat> and doing it in the real world is a lot different than in a laboratory like mine. So in Chicago, uh, there was weather, which is something some of us from California are now experiencing. Not enjoying, but experiencing. <laughs> and uh, so with weather, it means that you have to think about changes in temperature, right, vibrations, and that affects these quantum states. And I think part of the idea is, can this work in the real world? And it does, which is very exciting. So you've built a fiber optic network, or cables, or fiber optic cables under the ground, underground mostly, right. connecting University of Chicago with Argonne National Lab and Fermi Lab, is that Correct. right? Correct. And that's 100 plus miles. Correct. Of, and you're sending photons through that network mm -hmm. to carry information in a potentially very secure fashion, is that right? Right, right. And, and remind us again why it's secure? It's secure, suppose you're trying to eavesdrop on my information. Mm -hmm. Not that you would, but okay. imagine you tried. Imagine I'm a hacker. Yeah, imagine you're a hacker. Uh, so in the classical world, a very common way to steal your information, say your credit card information, is that uh, somebody will copy it, put it back, and then it goes to the destination and you don't really know if it's been copied, right? Um, until your credit card company calls you, like you guys, you know, call me and, and, and say something has happened. But in the quantum world, the nice thing about this property, which at first seems like a liability, but it's really an asset. If somebody tries to look at my credit card information, the act of looking at it changes it. So this just isn't possible. So these quantum properties offer a type of baked-in security that make this very unique. It's sort of an inherent quality of these quantum objects that right. when a hacker tries to observe them, it, he destroys, he or she destroys the information. He or she. Okay. Yeah. Could be a female hacker. Um, Morella, let's talk about your company. Um, tell me what, so you create software. Yes. You're a startup company that began in London, I believe, and now has that a Chicago correct. outpost. What sort of software do you make and who are your customers and potential customers? Yeah, sure. So we, uh, we make simulation software for quantum photonics applications. And as far as we are aware, we are, we are still the only ones doing this in the whole world. Um, so we're, we're early movers, um, and basically we streamline and accelerate the process, the design process for making the hardware for, for quantum computers and for quantum communication systems. Um, and our clients uh, currently are academics mm -hmm. um, in cutting edge research labs and um, also uh, telecoms providers like Toshiba, for example, who are providing uh, this, you know, the hardware for the quantum communication network that um, is, is here in Chicago. So, um, this is, this is going to be our first wave of uh, clients and then uh, we, we're going to address uh, foundries as well later on uh, when, yeah, maybe in a couple of years' time. Um, we, want to, we want to actually, um, we want to assist with the, um, achieving the scalability of this technology. So foundries will, semiconductor foundries will take up this effort of uh, mass producing uh, the components for these devices and we want to be there for them to, to facilitate this process and to make it actually possible because at the moment the current approaches are not, um, not, not fit for making uh, large batches of, of components. 
So you, you are making software that helps other technologists design hardware for quantum technology, for quantum computers, for quantum communication. That's right. right? Okay. Um, and the, you started the company, you and I think a co-founder started the company in London. And yes. you, how did you end up with the Chicago branch? Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, it's not very obvious. Um, but in 2021, uh, the Accelerator Duality was created um, here in Chicago, at the University of Chicago. And uh, the, the accelerators is, Accelerator is focused uh, specifically on uh, startups that are developing quantum technology solutions. It's the first accelerator in the, uh, in the US to do this. Um, and we applied for the accelerator not really expecting very much, not expecting to be selected in the inaugural cohort. Uh, but we made it, and we are the only uh, we were the, the only non-U.S. company to be um, to be selected. So we are we are very honoured by this, and uh, yeah, um, this is how it all started. And a part of the um, uh, some of the rules to, regarding participation on the program stipulated that one of the founders had to be located in Chicago for the entirety of the program. Uh, and I volunteered to do this, so this is why I'm here <laughs> today. And I think you were telling me earlier you might be hiring some more people in Chicago, is that right? That's and, right. And when, when might that happen and how many people would that uh, be? Or? Imminently. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're hiring two people and I, I think maybe one of them is here in the audience today. <laughs> um, but yes, um, absolutely. We're, we're, we're do, I'm doing that as, as soon as I can. So. Uh, we will have we will grow our team by 100% in the next week or so. so. Gotcha. Okay. Um, all right, Marco. You um, can you tell us a little bit how many quantum computers exist in the world today? I mean, not an exact number, but are we talking about dozens or hundreds? And what what can they do today? Not a lot of grand things, right? They can do kind of smaller calculations. I think we are below 100. What do you think, David? You know. So we have less than 100 computers worldwide. Globally. So fortunately, many companies have um, put these computers available for the mass. You know, you don't, you don't have to own a quantum computer for sure. You can access them through cloud systems. Um, some computers are a little better, so you have to pay for a fee if you want to access the premium computers. Some other computers are you know, not so great, but still available for, ac for access. So what can these computers do today? So for sure, we haven't reached the point in which uh, a pharmaceutical company can use them to, um, say, create a new drug for like a, a new vaccine or anything like that. We haven't reached the point in which a bank can use these computers to solve a portfolio optimization problem. We have not reached that point. Not, not yet. However, they're good enough to build the prototypes, to, to build the algorithms that uh, um, will be exactly the same algorithms that we will actually use when the computer becomes more powerful. So the algorithms that we build today are going to be the same algorithms that we will use in the future. That's it. It stopped working. The, the quantum computer has stopped working. I think it's okay. This, can you hear me? You okay, yeah. I came back. So um, I think that this is a crucial time for, for everybody to build these algorithms because they will be used in the future when the computers are powerful. And um, uh, we use the computers that we have today to test our algorithms on small data sets. So let's take portfolio optimization. I mentioned that a bank can have uh, a portfolio of uh, over a thousand assets. Uh, and we would have to optimize this portfolio just like we optimize the people sitting around the table on Thanksgiving. Um, so when we have a thousand assets, uh, we definitely we're going to need a super powerful quantum computer. The computers that we have now are good enough for like 20 or 40 assets. So good enough to test an algorithm. And uh, that's very important for us because so we know that uh, our algorithm is doing the right thing. We can test it and then we can uh, save it in our repository. So we, uh, we have the people can check very uh, solid software uh, discipline. We write the code in a very um, functional way that can be reused in the future. So that's, I think, another important thing. And this way, when uh, the time comes, we will be able to um, reuse our algorithms in production. Gotcha. 
So we have maybe 100 quantum computers that maybe exist globally. Less. Maybe more or less. <laughs> and David, what is difficult about building them? What is difficult about scaling them up to the point where someday maybe they will be more powerful than existing computers? So one of the big challenges is these quantum bits are really sensitive to the outside world, so you need to protect them. And you need to entangle them. They have to all see each other in a controlled way. And every time you add one, it's a harder and harder problem. Every time you add a new qubit. Every time you add another qubit. And okay. that scaling is really important. Because um, like today, if you want to double the size of your laptop, its computational power, let's say you have a million transistors, to double it, you'd have to add another million transistors. For quantum computers, say you had 10,000 quantum bits. To double it, you add one quantum bit, just one. And that doubles it, because they're all entangled. And that makes the problem harder. But that also, I think, illustrates why they're so immensely powerful. You, know, you get 10,000 bits, and you added 10,000. You end up with a quantum machine that's 2 to the 10,000 times as powerful, which is, by the way, an incredibly huge number. So, but controlling that is really hard. But you know, IBM had an announcement just last week that they've announced a machine with 433 quantum bits. And when we look at caffeine, your example I was looking at during your talk, my favorite molecule, actually, um, you know, that's now at the level where you can begin to calculate and simulate these things perfectly, which is pretty intriguing. I think maybe we should go to questions from the audience, um, if there are questions from the audience. If not, I'll just keep going. Okay, there we go. We've got some. Um, just a quick request to keep your questions brief and ending with a question mark, as another speaker said earlier today. Uh, yes, there, sir. Um, does JP Morgan work on any quantum hardware for like networks or like uh, are you building any quantum computers as well? I, sorry. Uh, JP Morgan, Chase, uh, do they work on, they have a quantum team. I'm wondering if they're building quantum hardware like quantum computers. I didn't quite catch it. That was a question from Marco, yeah? Uh, this, oh, oh, so what do I, oh, so I just talk slow, slower, or like, I talk like this. It's, it's only that there is a lot of echo. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of echo it's hard to, Okay, oh, so I just talk slower, okay. Does JP Morgan work on quantum hardware? Does JP Morgan? Does JP Morgan work on quantum algorithms? Hardware. 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 Ah, yeah, yeah. Hardware. Are you, <laughs> are you building your own hardware? Is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, so or? I wanted okay. to say, uh, this is a great question because it gives me an opportunity to say how uh, complex and diverse the quantum stack is. So uh, at the foundation, there is definitely quantum hardware. The, without quantum hardware, we wouldn't have any computation. Then on top of the, ha of the hardware, there is a layer called the circuits. And then there is the algorith al algorithmic layer. So JP Morgan Chase is definitely not in the business of uh, quantum hardware. We're not building uh, quantum computers. We don't own uh, quantum computers. Uh, we are renting quantum computing time from quantum hardware providers. So similarly to, similar to when you rent uh, cloud, uh, when you rent classical computing time on a, on a cloud system. So we do the same thing with quantum computing. So definitely not working at the level of hardware, um, but uh, we're working at the level of algorithms. So as I mentioned, this is good, you know, thinking about how many job opportunities there will be in the future, and they already are here actually, uh, for people who want to work in quantum computing, you don't have to necessarily be a hardware person. You can be just like me, for example, like a person working at the level of algorithms. There can be people working at the level of applications, like portfolio optimization applications. And then there are even people working at the level of like uh, interface, like a cloud interface for, for this entire stack. So for us, it's algorithms and applications at JP Morgan. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Questions? How about right here in the front? Sorry, there's a bright light. This, this gentleman here in the front. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I had always thought that um, financials would be the last uh, because you want um, banks to be very accurate and that most initial applications of quantum would be a material science where insights would be more 
important than accuracy. You say actually financials is the first and insight, yes. so insight is more important, insight and speed is more important than accuracy. Yes, so I think um, it's a, first of all, it's a conjecture, you know, nobody knows what will really happen, but uh, we see that uh, um, in finance, because we need answers right away and we have a lot of use cases, when you have a lot of use cases, um, the chances of finding these first wave applications that I mentioned before, so the applications that uh, lend themselves to quantum computing before others, so we have more applications, more chances to hit quantum advantage. Uh, before other industry domains. Um, the other industry domains don't have this urgency sometimes to get an answer in real time. So a, a quantum computer that perhaps runs for an entire day or maybe two days is still acceptable if the goal is to find uh, the formula for a new uh, vaccine or a new drug or a new material, a new plastic. Um, I think um, uh, spending a couple of days computing is totally fine. Uh, I know that, for example, to compute the formula for a new fertilizer, um, fertilizers, like um, the fertilizer industry is, I heard, the, the most polluting industry in, uh, in the world. So it would be great to find a new fertilizer that doesn't, whose construction doesn't pollute the world so much. So unfortunately, it is estimated that a classical compute, computer trying to find the formula for a new fertilizer might take 800,000 years. Um, when, when, whereas with a, um, a quantum computer, it is, it is estimated that it will take one day. So uh, one day is definitely doable. But in finance, one day is not acceptable. We need answers right away. That's why we are working very much in the financial industry to leverage the benefits of quantum computing. I, I was just going to add, uh, I think this idea of optimization, while it's clear it's important in finance, it's important in lots of other things, uh, like the Amazon driver. So the Amazon driver loads up his or her truck in the morning with like a thousand packages. How does this person know the most efficient way to deliver them in Chicago? It's a really hard problem, actually. Uh, but you can optimize that and find one path. You could also get home earlier, but you know, it's, it's actually a lot of energy savings. Uh, the same that Boeing has told us. If you want to build a 777 efficiently, there are millions of parts. So how do you know what order to build the plane? It takes them about 100 planes before they figure out the order. It's a huge waste of energy and time. But if you do this on day one, it would change things a lot. So I think there are lots of examples where optimization is important. Other questions? What do you think is the best candidate for uh, emerging quantum technologies, photon-based or ion trap devices? Or, um, I, I mean, what, what do you see as the emerging winning technology? Did you guys catch that? What, what's the best one? Yeah, David, do you want to take that? So any answer I was going to give would be wrong uh, because it's impossible to judge. I mean, honestly, Right now, there are a number of really exciting platforms that all have their, their advantages and disadvantages. You know, major companies are using superconductors as a way to build quantum bits. Emerging companies are using atoms trapped in really beautiful circuits to do quantum computing. There's photonic-based quantum computing. They all have their challenges. They're all moving very well. But honestly, I, I, if I knew the answer to that, I would have invested in one of them personally. <laughs> It's a, it's a great question, and a lot of people are asking that question. But I, you know, I, I think you know, we're in a time that's very much like the birth of the transistor. And when you read these history books and you say, what did these companies do when the transistor was invented? They patented all sorts of things, but they missed all the big ones, right? They never thought of integrated circuits, right? Or GPS or cell phones or lasers, because it's impossible, right? It's impossible to think of these things. And I think we're at that time. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, things are working really well, but honestly, I, I'm not sure any of us really know, well, I can speak for myself. I'm not sure that I know where the biggest impact is gonna be yet, but if we're not in this game and we're not doing this, we will certainly lose it. So I, I don't know what you think, but I think that's... Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so photonics in particular is uh, very good for 
transmitting quantum information from one place to another. So photonic qubits are, are, are very good for connecting, for example, different quantum processors together. If you want to make a more powerful processor, then you, you want to use photonic qubits. Um, the problem with photonic qubits is that it's difficult to keep them stationary. And if you, want to have, if you want to store them, if you want to store the quantum information, then it becomes more difficult to do that. Um, and so you, you know, there are other modalities, other uh, types of qubits that are more suitable for this kind of um, application. So in the future, we might get kind of a hybrid quantum computer where we use different qubits for different purposes. And also different quantum computers for different applications. Any other questions? Maybe back there, I see a hand going up. Yeah, that fellow there. Thank you, everyone. Um, if someone gave you a perfect fault-tolerant quantum computer, meaning uh, noiseless, uh, fully connected, and said you can, you can one, run one algorithm on it, what's the first thing you would do with it? would like to start. Marco, why don't right. you do so, that? Yeah. yeah, as I said before, we have a lot of use cases, so it's hard to choose, right? Uh, but uh, I think uh, one will be portfolio optimization, and another one will be like anything related to Monte Carlo simulations that we use for derivative pricing or risk analysis. So um, I think that would be the first uh, choice for us. Marilla, do you have a... <laughs> I would, I would probably just say, just solve climate change. <laughs> that's a good one. That's, okay. that's, <laughs> maybe, that's maybe a better <laughs> answer. I don't know. <laughs> but that probably won't be the first uh, useful algorithm that you, would, you will be able to is, run on a I mean, that's a good question. Computer. Is it going to help us solve climate change if we have a, a quantum computer? Well, in theory, yes, because it would. Um, so the quantum computer itself wouldn't really do just the, design, the whole designing of the molecule. So the idea is to design a molecule that will be able to capture carbon dioxide from the air and reduce the, the levels of carbon dioxide present in, in the atmosphere at the moment. Um, and uh, well, you could use a quantum computer to, the idea is to use a quantum computer to help a classical computer to crunch the numbers in order to come up with um, such a molecule. Um, we just have no idea what it will look like, but the quantum computer will help to arrive at a solution. Yeah, also, as, I as I mentioned before about the fertilizers, for example, so with quantum computers, you can actually um, produce new materials uh, that are less polluting. So you can first model them and then produce them, and these materials will be less polluting. You can also build, uh, some people are working on building uh, new substances that can be, um, that can capture the CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and also quantum computers in general, since they can, they have the potential of solving problems very fast um, and very accurately. So uh, instead of using these gigantic supercomputers, classical supercomputers that require almost like a, a, a nuclear plant to power them, uh, with a quantum computer, which is probably going to take a lot of power as well, but you can actually do many more computations because each one of them takes less time. So it is expected to see, we were expected to see quantum computing benefiting the environment. Gotcha, okay. And, and one of those main ways, as you said, is, is it will be better able to discover new materials that we can use to yes. take carbon dioxide exactly. out of the air, to make less polluting fertilizers, et cetera. Um, anyone else? Questions? Point there in the back, maybe. Or did you? Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. We're going to go with the. Thank you. Great conversation. Um, let me stand so you can see me. Maybe you can hear me better when you can see me. I'm very interested in learning about and being engaged with bringing new talent to the fold. We need to increase the number of people and the number of diversity that's involved in quantum. And we have a lot of students, and even myself, when we go for our Thanksgiving dinner, our family is not going to know what we're talking about. 
when we say that we work with quantum science. And for each of you, can you give us in one to two sentences, what would you say at the Thanksgiving dinner table? That's we want to hear from the experts. That's the best question of the night. You should have been moderating the panel. OK, folks, here we go. David? Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first thing I should say is you're lucky you're not going to have Thanksgiving with my family. <laughs> um, I mean that, actually. Um, well, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think maybe two things, two quick sentences. One is that there's another world that we don't experience but surrounds us every day in all the materials around us, which is this quantum world. And everyone is experiencing it. They just don't directly experience it, right? These chairs at the atomic level all follow these rules. So I, I would say on the table, what's happening right now in terms of thinking about getting people into this field, like maybe a few people around the table, um, is that the world is learning how to engineer these properties to our scale and live in a quantum world. And it's a remarkably exciting moment. But I, I would say that's the essence of all of this. When we go down the road here, Marilla, what would yeah, you say? So it's it's going to be my second ever Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so I don't know how these conversations normally go around the table. So. Quantum always comes up. Let me tell you, <laughs> Trump and quantum. Of course, it's it. traditional, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, I think. Um, so we're at the beginning of a new exciting field, and I think we should try and do our best to, um, to build the industry and the ecosystem in the best way possible uh, to benefit all of us and to include everybody uh, in the effort, in this amazing, exciting effort that can change the world. And um, yeah, we, we should make sure, that we should strive to include minorities, women, um, and uh, you know, disabled people, and everybody um, else, and to, to really change the way that things are, are being done. Um, I think that's, that would be one of the wishes I would have um, this Thanksgiving, if I could make a wish. And Marco, what would you I, say? I actually agree with this point, because I think, um, we have made a lot of mistakes, you know, in the history of technology, and we see like uh, not enough uh, women, not enough minorities in general. So maybe this is actually a good opportunity, finally, with this disruptive moment in technology, uh, to um, open the doors uh, in universities and so on. Let students know that there is there are good opportunities uh, to work in a new area. As I mentioned before, you don't have to necessarily be a physicist working on uh, uh, the hardware level. You can work at uh, higher levels of the stack. And uh, um, I think it's a good opportunity now to give new jobs to a lot of people in, in areas that uh, so far have, have been neglected. I think we're going to have to close there. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, a reminder before we go, they wanted me to let you know that anyone taking the bus to Hyde Park, the bus will leave in 10 minutes. Uh, so thank you very much to our speakers and to our audience for the great questions.